is the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. On today's program, we're going to talk about cracking the code. What code are we going to decipher or crack? Well, one of the primary codes that each one of us needs to crack or to decipher is the code of life in the sense of what makes life work. Where do we get the power from to make life work? What's the purpose of our life? Are there adversaries or enemies against life itself? And then if there are enemies or adversaries against life itself, who are these adversaries and how can we protect ourselves from them and defeat them? Because obviously the adversary of life would be death. We're going to get into this, and I believe that this will be of help to those of you as you enter a new season, a new year, and you don't have to get stuck into thinking, well, gee, I'm just going to have to repeat um, what happened last year. Maybe there'll be some subtle changes or slight changes, but basically um, this past year, and this new year, the new year will be simply a repeat of the last year. No, that's, 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 that's not, that's not living. That's not life. God has far more in store for you than that. So let's begin with something. Let's begin with the fact that in this world that you live in, And the world that you live in is far more complex and far deeper and far more multidimensional than anything you are told in the mainstream media or you've been told in the educational system or have been told by friends or whoever. The life that you're living now is far more complex and far more multilayered, if you will. So think about that for a moment. You began your life as a little child, and then somewhere along the way, as a very little child, you entered some kind of educational system, or daycare, or preschool, or kindergarten, or whatever, and they began to teach you things about life, and the things that they taught you about life became deeply ingrained in you, and you began to believe probably without even realizing uh, the depth in which you believed what they told you, you began to, what happened was there was, a, there was a, a transition. And you were unaware of it, as I was unaware of it, but you went to daycare and preschool and stuff like that, and they were teaching you things, you know. They were educating you. I mean, they said they were educating you. They call it education. And you, being naive and trusting, thought, well, they were telling you the truth, that they're, that they're helping you, they're educating you. Because after all, you must be ignorant, and therefore you need us to educate you. But somewhere along the line, at a very young age, what you were educated to believe went through like a a very subtle transition. And the subtle transition is that you began to believe that what they told you was like an absolute fact. You you, You began not to receive the information that they were teaching you as, quote, education. You began to believe in it with, with like a religious faith that, that is, was so powerful. You began to believe that what they told you was true, and then you took it further than that. Not only did you believe that what they told you was true, you began to believe that what they told you was the way life was constructed, the way life and the world that you're experiencing really is. So my question to you, most likely decades or many decades later, is this. Is what they told you, in terms of your being educated, 
Is what they told you in terms of what you were exposed to in the mainstream media and what people said to you, etc., is what they told you the truth? Everything that you learned to believe, was it true? Was it true what they told you to believe? Because most people are living their lives exactly the way they were told to live their lives. And that's all based on deep-rooted beliefs that people have about what life is about. So people are operating their lives on some kind of code, like, you know, there's computer code. Um, people are operating their lives based on some kind of code that they received. But the question is, is that code true? Does, does the code work? Is the code accurate? Well, only you can answer whether it's true or accurate or not. But going back to one of the original things I asked you at the very beginning of this program, the Paul McGuire report, that there are enemies in life and that it's important to understand and to recognize that there are enemies in life because the purpose of an enemy is to kill and to destroy you. An enemy wants to create death in your life, not life in your life. An enemy wants to destroy you, kill, kill you, which means death. In fact, the Bible talks about a powerful spiritual enemy which is the devil, or Satan, or Lucifer. And it says, who goes about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Not only your life personally, but other people's lives. So you're in this world, which we call life. But in this world, which we call life, there exists a very hostile force, a dangerous force, a very real enemy who, whose goal is to kill, steal, and destroy not only from your life personally, but from the lives of people around you or close to you or the, those that you love and the lives of many other people. So let me go back to the original question regarding whether or not you think you were educated or whether or not you received information that was true from the mainstream media or school or whatever or from other people. One way you can evaluate whether or not your education was valid or what people told you was true or not or whether the mainstream media actually communicated truth to you, one way you can evaluate it is to look at life, the life that you're in, and just pick any question. So let's pick the question of this. Let's go back to a couple of sentences ago. In this life that we live, there exists a hostile for force, an enemy, and the goal of this enemy is to kill, steal, and destroy your life. And therefore, as any soldier knows, as any general knows, in a war, whether it's a spiritual war or physical war, if you do not take practical, intelligent, proactive steps to protect yourself or your nation from an enemy then that enemy will seek to exploit your weakness or weaknesses. And that enemy, you can be sure, will kill, steal, destroy, enslave, and, if possible, obliterate your nation off the face of the earth. Especially in our era of weapons of mass destruction. So if that's true on a physical, military level, how much more true is it in a personal and
beyond individual level. In other words, let me ask you, let me just be really blunt. At any time during your education, um, either in preschool or kindergarten or grammar school or first grade or whatever, at any time in your education, and let's look at the mainstream media too, let's include that, and let's include music and film and stuff and people talking to you. At any time in your education, did anyone or any institution properly inform you and educate you and make you aware and alert to the fact that, first of all, you're in life, did they, did, did they teach you that? Did they explain life to you? After all, that's what you're living in. And then secondly, regarding this life that you're definitely in, did any of these institutions, these educational programs, these people, the, the media, did they ever educate you, alert you to, or inform you about the reality that you actually have an enemy, a real enemy that seeks to kill and destroy you, those that you love, and the peoples and communities that you represent, that, that you are part of. Were you ever taught properly and adequately and sufficiently about the real existence of an ever present danger to your life? Were you ever educated about the fact that indeed there is an enemy that seeks to kill and destroy you and those that you love? Now think about that for a moment. Think about that for a moment because your very survival as a person, the survival of those you love, is based on what information and facts you have or as they would say in military circles, your very survival is based on the effectiveness and accuracy of what they term military intelligence, facts and information about the existence of an enemy and what your enemy's up to. So in your own personal life, if it's important to survive and to live and to protect yourself and loved ones, that implies that you must, out of necessity, you absolutely must know a sufficient, comprehensive amount of factual information. First of all, educating you above everything else about the existence of an enemy that you have and what your enemy plans to do to you, and what you can do to protect yourself from that enemy. Because if you don't have that primary, basic, fundamental information, you're going to go down, you're going to go down hard, you're going to be destroyed, and those that you love are going to be destroyed. So let's just take a pause and think about it. Remember back in time to your earliest school years, kindergarten, daycare, I don't know, preschool, whatever you want to call it, did anybody inform you properly about the reality of an enemy? Were you prepared in any way for it? Did the media prepare you in any way for it? Did the government prepare you in any way for it? Did music or television or film prepare you? Did, you, did, did your friends pass along that information. Now well, think about that for a moment. Because that information is absolutely so vital for your survival. Now I would imagine some of you would say that you did receive such information about the fact that you have an enemy. And you did learn something about how to Understand that there that you have an enemy and how to protect yourself from that enemy. And most of you who would say that you were informed about the nature and existence of an enemy probably received that education and information from non-traditional sources. In other words, 
mainstream media didn't give it to you. The official educational system certainly didn't give it to you. Most of your friends and associates didn't give it to you. The music and television and film industry absolutely didn't give it to you. Most likely, those of you who say that you were informed about an enemy, most likely you received the benefit of some kind of Christian or biblical instruction, either from your parents or a church, a Bible-believing church, or some kind of Bible teaching, and it was imparted to you by somebody who cared about you and loved you. And because they cared enough about you and loved you enough, they wanted you to live. They wanted you to survive. So they taught you something about the fact that you do have an enemy in this life. The enemy seeks to destroy you. And they taught you something about how you could defeat this enemy. Now, just because you were raised in a Christian household or went to a Christian school or went to a Christian church is certainly no guarantee whatsoever that anybody ever gave you this information. So the mere fact that you attended some kind of Christian institution or were raised in a Christian family doesn't in any shape or form uh, guarantee that you were informed of this important fact. But there are those people, individuals and groups and institutions who operate towards operate according to a far higher commitment and a far higher ethical lo- level. And those are the people that I would just quite simply say are the people who really loved you. No, not who said I love you, but who really loved you. Those people who really loved you in the true sense of the word. And the true sense of the word love, by the way, would be the term agape love. Because it's the agape love which describes the love, the spiritual love of Jesus Christ. Agape love is pure love. It's it's the only pure love. Agape love is the kind of love that cares more about you Somebody who's loving you with agape love is willing to die for you. They care more about you than they do themselves. Agape love is the love of Jesus Christ, and agape love is what Jesus Christ did when he loved you and others so much that he died for you on a cross by taking the penalty of your sins upon himself. That's agape love. Other forms of love that are very prevalent in our society and world would be not agape love, but things like eros love or erotic love. Eros love or erotic love is essentially a form of love which is based on a simple formula. Somebody becomes a sexual object of gratification. And to the degree that this other individual is able to satisfy another individual's lusts, sexual desires, or whatever, to the degree that the individual who who is objectified can satisfy the other individual, then they will receive a a kind of love, but it's really a kind of payment. Because it's not a self-sacrificing love, it's a self-satisfying love. And that's a very popular form of love, eros or erotic love. Basically, as long as you turn me on, I love you. That's the, 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 the short phrase for explaining the eros kind of love. And that would include, by the way, romantic love or Valentine's Day love. And I hate to be a heartbreaker, no pun intended, but Valentine's Day love or romantic love is self-satisfying love. 
the emphasis in romantic love or Valentine's Day love is not necessarily the consum consummation of um, or completion of a physical act or physical acts of gratification, although it usually at some point involves that. But as long as another individual is able to satisfy the romantic longings you have, and romantic long longings may be uh, intertwined with eros or erotic longings, but many times romantic longings don't have to explicit, explicitly intertwine with erotic feelings. They may be more in the area of, of a strong sense of euphoric emotion that, that another person can bring you, which we call romantic love, or I fell in love with somebody. But that person or object, again, it's a form of objectification, really only has your love or value to the degree they can satisfy your romantic longings. You know, the Valentine's card stuff. And so that, too, is a very popular form of love. But it's not the pure form of love. It's not the love of God, which is known as the agape love of Jesus Christ. And then finally, we have another form of love, filial love. And this is the kind of love which is often called natural love. Filial love is the love that a mother or father would naturally have towards their children or their son or daughter. Filial love is uh, naturally felt between uh, sometimes two good friends, uh, obviously platonic friends, um, filial love is the friendship you could have to some degree or whatever um, maybe a minor degree but people all on the same baseball team or football basketball team or whatever that sense of com camaraderie that sense of uh, brotherhood or sisterhood or whatever so those are the various forms of love now if we go back into our past and the education or the daycare or whatever that we all had to one degree or another, we have to ask ourselves, who cared about us enough to provide us with information of, of the utmost importance that would enable us to survive and to live without being destroyed? Who cared enough about us to love us and it wasn't necessarily the person who made you laugh the most. It wasn't necessarily the person who made you feel good the most. It wasn't necessarily the most popular or the hip or the coolest person there was. It may have been somebody who didn't have any of those attributes. But the person, in the final analysis, who really loved you with the purest form of love, which is the agape love of Jesus Christ, put aside all of their fears about being socially rejected, put aside these other concerns, and they took a risk for you. They took a risk for you. They may have even laid down their lives for you to one degree or another because they loved you enough to risk giving you perhaps one of the most important messages in your life because they wanted to see you live, you fulfill the destiny that God has for you. And they were actually living out the agape love of Jesus Christ, which is not primarily concerned about self, it's more concerned about the other person. And as such, it's willing to take a risk for the other person. So, who really loved you? The handsome guy with the flowers? The beautiful girl who kissed you? You know, we can go on and on. Who really loved you? Or the person who tried to give you information that would enable you to survive 
and live and fulfill the destiny that God created you for? I would say it's kind of obvious. The person who really loved you is the person who told you the truth because the truth sets you free and it's the truth that enables you to survive. I mean, look, let's, let's just get really simple here and really basic. If somebody says they love you or somebody pretends to love you or somebody advertises the fact they care about you, etc., 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 but they leave you naked and vulnerable and they fail to tell you that you're going to, that you're not going to, but you've already entered into a world where there is a dangerous potential threat and that you have an actual enemy who is going to seek to destroy you, kill you, and end your life. If, if someone fails to give you that basic information, I, I, would, I would say that they don't really love you. Because how could you claim to love somebody and then just passively and indifferently uh, come in contact with somebody's life over a period of time and fail to tell them the truth that will enable them to survive. I mean, what loving person could do that? That's like raising your kid and then throwing your kid to the wolves, to starving wolves. No sane, really loving person would do that. Only a very selfish person would do that. So, let's, let's just throw the ball deeper out into the ocean and see if it comes back with the tide. The fact is, whether you believe in it or not, or whether any believe, anybody else believes in it or not, based on what the Word of God says from Genesis to Revelation, the Bible very clearly teaches us the fact that we have a very evil spiritual enemy, an enemy who seeks to kill, destroy, rob, and demolish our lives and the lives of people we love. And that enemy is identified as Satan or Lucifer, the, the highest ranking angel in God's order. An angel that was so gifted, so beautiful, so talented, so intelligent that he was almost godlike. And yet he was not happy being, let's say, God's right hand man. That exalted position was not good enough for him. He actually wanted to be God, but he wasn't God. So the only way he could be God would be to lie to himself and others. That's why Satan is called the father of lies. And the only way he could be God would be to lead a revolution, which he did with one-third of the angels, who became one-third of the fallen angels, and they are currently leading a revolution against God and his kingdom and God's angels and God's people in a spiritual war that's taking place in the physical dimension of earth as well as multi-dimensions such as the spiritual world or the invisible realm or the parallel universe or whatever you want to call it. This raging war is going on all around us. And you whether you know it or not, or want to acknowledge it or not, many things that are behind what appear to be ordinary things or what appear to be circumstantial things, many times these things have a spiritual origination. And many times these things can actually be initiated by the very real spiritual enemy you have whose name is Lucifer or Satan and under the command of Lucifer or Satan are powerful fallen angels and human beings who, who have sold their soul uh, to, to function as Lucifer's servants or agents. Now not everything that happens to us that constitutes adversity is is uh, originated by the devil or Lucifer. I mean, you know, things just happen in life. Sometimes you'll drive your car 
tire over a nail, you'll have to get that replaced. I mean, there's a, a zillion things in life that don't necessarily uh, suggest some enemy entering your life. But there are other things in life that if you exercise spiritual discernment and you look carefully, you will discern the fact that they're not accidental, they're not random. They are brought about by an enemy intruder who is your enemy. And you must have the information, the knowledge, the training, the preparedness to deal, to defeat this spiritual enemy. Because if you don't, this enemy will destroy you. And he will destroy absolutely everything he can, including your loved ones, your children, your health, everything, your nation. As much room as you allow him to take, he will take it all and more. I want you to think about that for a moment. Now, we're not going to just stay here in, in a place of uh, alarm. We're going to move beyond that into like what you do about it. Because you see, when you learn what to do about it, that has everything to do with how your life is going to turn out between now and however long you end up here in life on planet Earth. You're listening to the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. I believe this program has information. It has a message that will help people that you know. And if you love them, I want to suggest that you put your love into action by sending them a link of this program so we can do an end run around all the hidden censorship on the Internet. Simply go to paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. And uh, you can do that. Also, we have so much free articles with illustrations at paulmcguire.us. The entire Paul McGuire Report radio archives for you to enjoy for free. The Paul McGuire television programming, conferences, Paradise Mountain Church meeting, prophecy teachings, uh, Paul McGuire emergency prophetic alerts, all kinds of video, all kinds of articles, uh, a brand new documentary on American Mind Wars, the coming crisis event, which is a must watch. You can download that at paulmcguire.us. And uh, a book, um, Trumpocalypse, is coming out in paperback, the paperback edition, in just a couple of days. So visit paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. And we'll be back in just a second. You're listening to Paul McGuire, and uh, we got a lot more for you. This is the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. I want to suggest to you that um, you send this message, you send this program to somebody that you believe in your heart needs to hear it. And again, I want to remind you, you can do that by simply going to paulmcguire.us and send them a link of this exact program for free or any other program. People need to hear this message. You know, most people have never heard this message. And that would include a very, very large percentage of people who call themselves uh, Christians or whatever. So let's go back to this reality. And the reality is that in life, you have, and mankind has, every person alive has, an enemy in life. And I'm not talking about, <clears throat> you know, some person who's mad at you or whatever. Uh, I'm talking about an enemy that is multidimensional in nature. In other words, every person in life has an enemy. Now, some people don't recognize that they do have an enemy. They think that's nonsense. They think that's like a fairy tale. You know, like like Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny. And, you know, they have the power and the free will to believe 
the lie that they have no enemy. But the fact of the matter is they do have an enemy. And that enemy, according to the Word of God, has a game plan and a goal and a specific set of strategies to destroy their lives. And ultimately, if we really get down to it, life, and we're all in life right now, life is a spiritual battlefield that takes place on a number of dimensions. And ultimately, the greatest spiritual battle of all involves a battle that is never discussed in the mainstream media. Why is that, by the way? Talk about fake news. Why is it the mainstream media never discusses the most important battle that every man and woman faces? Or even remotely, the mainstream media will not even remotely, nor the entertainment industry, etc., nor the school system, nor the so-called self-anointed schools of higher learning or whatever, why is it that none of them will acknowledge, discuss the reality of uh, all-out warfare that exists on planet Earth right now, that right now every one of us is involved in an all-out spiritual war for the souls, hearts, and minds of mankind, men and women. In other words, there is a violent, raging, spiritual battle, primarily in the invisible realm or spiritual world, regarding every human being alive. And what the battle is about is whether or not Two competing forces, one is God and one is the devil, and God because he is love, and God because he loves every man and woman alive, it is God's greatest desire for God to save or rescue every man or woman alive in this life. It's God's desire to rescue them. That's why God is referred to as the Savior, or Jesus Christ is referred to as the Savior. God's desire is to send His Son, Jesus Christ, to save every man or woman alive and bring them supernaturally into heaven, where because God loves them, it's God's greatest desire and wish that He can spend all eternity with every person He created, both male and female, in heaven, in the new heaven, the new earth, the new Jerusalem, to live together with God in paradise. That's God's greatest desire. And to show you just how deep a love that God has for everyone, we understand the depth of God's love by the fact that he gave up his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to literally die the most painful and agonizing death on the cross to pay for every person's sins by personally taking the punishment and penalty for every person's sins who's ever lived so that if they place their faith in the saving message of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of their sins and they invite Christ into their lives to save them, that the death of Jesus Christ and the blood of Jesus Christ will allow God to save them and they can spend all eternity with God in heaven where all their dreams, where their true purpose and destiny will be released. That's how loving God is. But God, because he's omniscient, because he understands everything, recognizes that there is an enemy to his plan and that enemy is a renegade angel, a fallen angel named Lucifer or Satan, who is trying to be God. And so Satan or Lucifer is at war with God and it's Satan's game plan in this war to deceive every man and woman alive from 
God's salvation in Jesus Christ to blind them from understanding what it's even all about. And it's Satan's desire to steal their souls, to steal the lives of billions of people, men and women, in this lifetime and throughout history, and to steal them so that Satan can take all these people who reject the, the saving message of Jesus Christ. It's Satan. It's Satan's plan. It's his desire to steal the souls and the lives and the people by blinding them from the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Satan knows that he is going to be sentenced for all eternity into a cosmic prison called hell or the lake of fire. And it is Satan's goal to to take with him as many men and women as he possibly can, can do through deception so that Satan will not spend all of eternity in hell by himself with the fallen angels, but there will be hundreds of million men and women who will spend all eternity in hell with Satan in the lake of fire in this cosmic prison called hell. That's the stakes of this massive spiritual warfare we're involved in. And so Satan uses his devices, which are spiritual deception, lies, supernatural blinding, seduction, and God uses the truth and the power of his Holy Spirit. But every one of us, every one of our lives, from the primary spiritual battle of life, which is whether or not we will be saved, whether or not we will receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. But then, before we're saved and after we're saved, there is a massive battle going on regarding every one of our lives over whether or not we will, individually, our loved ones, our children, etc., over whether or not we will fulfill God's destiny, God's plan, God's purpose for our lives, or whether we will allow this enemy to defeat us and to prevent God's destiny and God's purpose from being realized in our lives. That's the battle. And in addition to that battle, there are endless other battles that regard um, either blocking or preventing God from delivering, saving, healing, intervening, or battles in which the evil one, the enemy, is allowed to destroy and do acts of unspeakable evil. Unspeakable evil. Let me give you one example of this. As I said, you and I, everyone you know on planet Earth right now, and it's been going on since the beginning of time, we're involved in the greatest spiritual battle, especially in the time period that you and I live in, because we are in the latter part of what Bible prophecy says are the last days. So because we live in the latter part of the last days, we're involved in the greatest spiritual battle for the hearts and souls of mankind in the history of the world. Because time is running out. We're approaching the end of the age. Now, Satan is going to block as many people as he can from receiving Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. But Satan also has other plans revealed in the Bible, like the book of Revelation. And Satan is planning a counterfeit kingdom of heaven on earth called the New World Order, or the One World Government, the One World Religion, and the One World Economic System, also known as Mystery Babylon. We describe this and explain this at length in our book, uh, The Babylon Code, that I wrote with Troy Anderson. So this is a massive battle that's going on right now. In every person's mind and heart that has ever lived, we all operate, we all live, we all have some kind of belief system. We all possess certain ideas that we build or base our life on. Every one of us do. We, not, we may not be aware of the fact 
that we have built our lives on or based our decisions on certain ideas or certain belief systems. We, we may not be aware of it, but beneath the surface, that's happening. So every man and woman alive is conduct our lives, making choices, making decisions, and making actions based on some kind of internal idea, okay, or belief. That's very important to understand. That's very important to grasp. That should not go unnoticed to you if you're wise. And you will only increase in wisdom if you will observe that fact and, and mine it and, and get all of the rich truth from it that you can. To say it in the simplest terms, and this is a term that I borrow from uh, one of my primary spiritual mentors in life, which is Dr. Francis Schaeffer, the great evangelical theologian, who said the expression, I'm sure he wasn't the only one to say it, but he, said, he would remark that ideas have consequences. So every idea that you and I have, or a nation has, or a uh, society has, or anybody has, every time a human being, or a group of human beings, has an idea, that idea always brings about consequences. Therefore, good ideas bring about consequences. Bad ideas bring about bad consequences. That's very important to understand. I mean, it's simple, but it's important. So, let's go to a very simple illustration. The idea or ideology of, let's say, communism and Marxism is what can be called a bad idea. I mean, that's assuming you have a brain that's operating. You've, if you have a brain that is operating and operational, it is obvious that communism and Marxism is a bad idea. Why? Because the factual historical results of communism and Marxism are always the same. Mass poverty, mass enslavement, mass deaths, and mass cruelty, and other unspeakable horrors. And, and, and for all those that like to champion uh, communism and Marxism, well, you can always just ask them this question. If communism and Marxism is so great, why is it that there's not a single communist Marxist nation on planet Earth or a single communist Marxist nation that ever existed in which were sneaking across the border to get into a communist nation? The answer is that it's never happened. Nowhere in human history has anybody snuck into any communist nation or tried to get into a communist nation illegally. It never happens. You know why? Because all around planet Earth, with the exception of parts, many parts in the United States and the, the U.S. media, uh, all around the world, people know the obvious is that communism is a, is a Frankenstein, it's a monster. Nobody wants to get into a communist nation anywhere on earth. Everyone wants to sneak into a capitalist and relatively free nation like the United States. The reason everybody is trying to get into the United States, despite what the media says, is because the United States is still, to a large degree, governed by a capitalist system and a Christian-based system in which there is freedom. Freedom under attack, but there's still freedom. That's the proof of the pudding. Nobody, anywhere, is sneaking into a communist nation. Nobody wants it. So for all these people who, who took too much PCP, or smoke too much crack, or whatever, and uh, got their degrees from Yale or whatever, for all the crackheads out there uh, who, who, who nourish off the breast of American capitalism and Christianity, and then turn around and despise 
their mother nation and embrace this Frankenstein form of government called communism or Marxism, nobody except a privileged few who can afford the, 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 the luxury of being deluded believe that communism or Marxism is a good idea. Everybody knows it's a hellish, rotten idea. Everybody knows, anybody who knows history, except some cult-like believer in socialism or progressivism or Marxism or communism, only those that are drank the Kool-Aid or are in the cult of communism, only those, it's a good idea, anybody, anywhere, who is even remotely sane knows that communism is a horror show. And why is that? Because it's a bad idea. It doesn't work. It's nothing personal. It's just a lousy idea. And as a bad idea, it produces a bad system. Conversely, despite the fact that capitalism and uh, a Christian-based nation is imperfect, obviously, but despite that, the fact America remains the number one destination point, the number one nation on planet Earth that everybody, for the most part, not, well, for, everybody in every nation on Earth, the number one nation they're trying to sneak into or illegally migrate into is the United States of America. And you, you don't hear that in the media, of course. And why are they trying to get here? Because they're escaping communist um, Marxist nations. I mean, why? why? Why did it happen? Because America was founded on good ideas. Those good ideas came from the... The good ideas were then put into our Constitution and Bill of Rights. So the good ideas upon which America is based produce good consequences. And despite our imperfections, we got the hottest thing going in the world. You wouldn't know that from the mainstream media because they don't want you to know that. So ideas have consequences. In the same way, what you believe internally, your idea system, your ideology, your belief system, it has consequences. So, if you're going to choose to be an airhead, it doesn't start out being your fault. So, I'm not saying in some unkind way that you were born an airhead. I'm not saying that. But I am saying we, we were all indoctrinated and brainwashed with a lot of bad ideas when we began day school, preschool, kindergarten, first grade, and so on and so forth. Every one of us were were. were in, embedded and programmed with bad ideas. First of all, most of what we believe is based on a lie. What we believe about re reality is based on a lie. What we believe about God is based on a lie. What we believe about just about anything of, of, of a massive nature and importance is based on a lie. The very nature and the origin, origin of man is based on a lie, as what is taught in the school systems and the media. So, we have been fed an intravenous drip of bad ideas because we were exposed to the media, we were exposed to the curriculum, the education, educational material. And they pumped us in the mind control factories of America with bad ideas. And one of the primary bad ideas is that there is no God, that they told us that in a million different ways. And then they told us that we're just living. Life has no meaning. And then they totally didn't tell us anything about the fact that we have an enemy that is out to destroy us by any means possible. Now that's a very bad idea because it makes us totally vulnerable, to totally open to being destroyed, subjugated, captured, annihilated by this enemy. 
And one of the primary reasons they methodically, strategically, and deliberately did not teach us about the existence of an enemy is because if they told us the truth about a very real enemy which exists, that would inevitably open the door for them to have to answer questions and thoughts which would open up other doors of truth that they don't want to tell us. In other words, if they began to teach us that we had an enemy, they would then have to explain that there is a Satan, that there is a Lucifer. Then they would have to admit that there was a God. Then they would have to admit that there's a war between God and Satan. And on and on and on. And the next thing you know, they'd have to admit that we're all sinners in need of a Savior. So they just took the shortcut and performed a kind of lobotomy. And the lobotomy is one of the most effective ways to give a non-surgical lobotomy is if you want to destroy an idea before it even begins in the human mind and heart, you simply stop talking about something you don't acknowledge something. You pretend and act as if something doesn't exist. Now, I hope you paid attention to that, because right there is the, the secret sauce, you will, of the whole mind control indoctrination system. Notice that the media, the mainstream media, that music, entertainment, uh, education, um, daycare, all of these things have something in common. Notice that all of these spheres of influence completely do not acknowledge, ignore, pretend that it doesn't even exist, and are completely silent about the fact that there is a God, that there is a Creator, and that this Creator is in a spiritual war over the souls of every man and woman with a fallen angel named Lucifer Satan. Notice that the entire truth system of biblical thought and the very existence of God and the fact that we do have a spiritual enemy is not, is not even acknowledged it's completely blanked out. It's, it, it, they made it disappear because they never talk about it. And you see, by never, and I really, I want you to, to pray to the Lord that, that you would, and I don't mean to sound in any way um, even remotely arrogant, but I, I feel this so strongly that I really ask that you would pray and think about this. And this is what I'm trying to communicate. When any system, whether it's education, media, whatever, when people or any system stops acknowledging the reality of something, does not acknowledge the reality or the existence of something which is really there, when any system or person pretends that something does not exist, which does exist, or never, never will admit that there's any reality to things that are very real. And what I'm talking about, an entire media, educational world system, which intentionally makes no reference or acknowledgement to God, Lucifer, Satan, eternity, spiritual things. There's no acknowledgement of it. There's no discussion of it. There's no reference to it. They pretend it does not exist. They will never bring it up in conversation. It's like they've erased it. Now, what that does to the mind of hundreds of millions of people, from young children to adults, is when you do that on a regular, consistent, and habitual basis, you basically pretend that something does not exist, what you end up doing is you neurologically erase it from the human mind. 
So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. People think, because nobody talks about God, nobody discusses God, nobody discusses the reality of the warfare between God and Satan, <clears throat> all of this stuff is obviously <clears throat> not even worth talking about. It just doesn't exist. Right there is the greatest lie that will ever be perpetuated upon children and people. That is the essence of the greatest lie of the world system, in, in an essence. This all-encompassing lie that God doesn't exist, that life is an accident, that you don't have an enemy in life, all of these things, and the fact that you erase them and never make reference to them is one, is one of the most vicious, cruel, sinister techniques of literally performing a lobotomy or an amputation on the human brain. That's exactly what it is. Now, what does it have to have to do with the new year, the beginning year? Absolutely everything. Absolutely everything, because ideas have consequences. Now, before I continue, I want to encourage you to visit paulmcguire.us, that's paulmcguire.us, and send this program to somebody that needs to hear it. Take advantage of the resources that we have to get you up to speed, to educate you, to give you knowledge, gives you power. And you can take advantage of many specials that we have right now on our books, our new video documentary, uh, American Mind Wars, the coming crisis event that you can download, and uh, the paperback release of Trumpocalypse coming out in the next day or two in paperback for the first time and uh, other books which we have in packages like A Prophecy of the Future of America, Conquering the Matrix and Mass Awakening which deal by the way with mind control and the erasure of memory and consciousness. These all have practical applications to your life by the way. And then most importantly I want to share with you the mission, the heartbeat of this ministry. And the heartbeat of this ministry, Paul McGuire Ministries in Paradise Mountain Church, is this. We recognize that we are in the latter part of the last days and that we're in the, right now we're in the greatest spiritual battle in the history of mankind. And the battle is for the hearts and souls of mankind. And everything we do Everything you do at Paul McGuire Ministries in Paradise Mountain Church is designed to reach people effectively, to save souls, to make disciples of all nations, to equip biblically and teach people biblically how to <clears throat> occupy the land until Christ comes and to do kingdom business until Jesus Christ comes. And I just want to, to say this to you, that I am critically aware when I say critically aware, I'm talking about 24-7. I am always aware. It's ever-present in me. It never leaves me. Never. I am always aware of the fact that at any given moment in time, at any second in any day, there are multiplied millions of people somewhere on planet Earth who on an individual level are asking questions about God. Does he exist? They're asking questions about Jesus, but they don't know anything about Jesus. They're wondering how to be saved, but they don't never even heard the word saved. Or the multiplied millions of people who live in places like the United States of America who've had some exposure to the Bible and Christianity, but whatever exposure they had was negative, and it has driven them away from the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why Wicca, or witchcraft, is the fastest growing religion in America. Because people got burned out through a bad dose and a bad presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I'm aware of the fact that at any second, at any time of the day, millions of people 
are attempting to reach out to the Lord, are attempting to, to, to get answers. On, and I have a burden from the Lord. It's very heavy and very deep. And I'm thankful for this burden. That it is with the utmost urgency that you and I must reach these people before the Lord returns because now is the time of the great last day's soul harvest. And I am very, very sobered by the words of Jesus Christ, as I'm sure you are, when he said that, Jesus Christ said, the fields are white for harvest. Souls are ready to be saved. But then Jesus said, but the laborers are few. Pray that the Lord of the harvest will send out more laborers. In other words, Jesus was saying, there's hundreds of millions of people ready to be saved, but there's no laborers. There's no. There's nobody going out into the harvest fields bringing in the souls, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's just a ha- tiny handful, and we're at the time of the last day's harvest, and it's the very heartbeat of God that every man and woman alive, it's the desire of God that every man and woman alive would come to Christ and spend all eternity with God. Now, ultimately, that's up to them. But we've got to get out there and effectively reach people for Jesus Christ. That is my heartbeat. That is everything this ministry we do is devoted to those objectives. And so, as we enter the new year, we must, for the sake of the love of God, we must expand our outreach, our television, our radio, our video, our documentaries, our church meetings, our teachings, our our prophecy messages, our books, all of these things are mechanisms of communication, social media, other kinds of media. Every kind of media known to man must be employed, but it has effectively, or nothing's going to happen. See, that's, that's what breaks my heart. If you fish with the wrong bait, you're not going to catch any, catch any fish. And we were called to be fishers of men. So I ask you to join with me and share with me this burden from the Holy Spirit of bringing in the last day's soul harvest. And you can do that by committing to be a prayer warrior for me in this ministry and my family. You can do that by constantly spreading this message around the sensors on the internet and you can do that by seeking the Lord as to how much you can contribute, donate financially to make this ministry happen so that we can win souls. And you do that by simply praying to God and asking Him to tell you what to do. And consider seeking the Lord about how you can contribute before the year ends or right after the year ends and help us launch out farther and wider to bring in the last day soul, har- soul harvest. And again, visit paulmcguire.us. we got so many things for you. Okay. Now, let's go to, to this, this issue. We're in the battle for the hearts and souls of mankind. <clears throat> and yet, countless millions of people have been programmed from childhood not to even acknowledge the existence of God, not to even be aware of the fact that they have a spiritual enemy. And so, when it comes to to, to this area, God created every man and woman, and he had a purpose in mind for every man and woman. God's the creator, capital C. God knows which people are going to come to him before they actually receive him by faith. And God's plan for every man and woman, but God has a plan very specifically for every man and woman who will come to him and receive Christ as their Lord and Savior. God has a plan for you, a destiny for you to fulfill. And you can be certain that because God has a specific plan and destiny for you to fulfill, you can be certain that your enemy the devil and those that are organizationally under the devil are going to do everything they can to block, stop, prevent, kill 
the plan and destiny of God in your life from being fulfilled. Why? Because the very fact that you are a true, true child of God, the very fact that you are born again by the Holy Spirit of God, means your very existence is a threat to the kingdom of Satan. And, and God knows that as he blesses you and raises you up and gives you favor, that you're going to use your influence to win souls. And that's God's plan for you. But the devil and the fallen angels also know that if that happens, your life will be an instrument to influence people with the word of God, to win souls, and to shine light in the darkness. And the devil doesn't want that to happen. So the devil is committed to destroying the fulfillment of your destiny, purpose, and plan as fast as he can. So, now ask yourself the question, here I am in life, and in this life, I have these dreams and desires and concepts, and we talked a whole lot about this on, I believe, yesterday's program on the Paul McGuire Report, which you should listen to. And you have these dreams that you know God has put in your heart about what you should do, and it could be involve everything from parenting to, to a job, an occupation, a career, a ministry, a part-time ministry, a gift, a talent, serving when nobody's looking, giving up your own time and life to, to minister to an elderly sick person. I mean, so many people, I mean, God's purpose in life is not always glamour time. There's a lot of people serving God's plan and purpose for their life, and they are unknown to everybody. They're there taking care of a elderly parent with Alzheimer's or dementia or, or, or ministering and taking the weight and responsibility to take care for somebody who's sick or dealing with something and, and, and the trials and tribulations in those areas are endless. Nobody notices. God notices. God notices what you're doing. And the pain of that, let's not be romantically Disneyland-like in our thinking. It's very hard to do those things. Those of you that have done them know what I'm talking about. But God sees what you're doing. And even though people may not appreciate the eternal value of what you're doing, God not only notices this, notices that, He appreciates it, and God has every intention of rewarding it. Now, I want to add something to that, and that is, in those matters, it is critical that you seek the Lord and you cry out to God for wisdom and you think things through. Because there are times when the Lord is, yes, the Lord is calling you to pick up your cross and follow Jesus and give up your life or part of your life so that somebody else can live. That's true. God does that all the time. But it is imperative for you to stay connected to the Lord on a regular basis and continually seek His face and cry out to Him for wisdom. The reason being is that you must have moment-by-moment wisdom from God Because in these matters that I just briefly touched upon, sometimes things change. And sometimes, and I'm not trying to give somebody an excuse to bail out of their responsibility. I'm not trying to open up a back door for somebody to run away from their God-given responsibilities. That's not my intent here. My intent is to just exhort you to develop your discernment because there may be changes in situations in which, again, understand that I'm not not giving people a license to, to run away from their responsibilities. But you 
must stay connected with the Lord because there may be changes in the circumstances and there may be times when the Lord may reassign what you, he had you doing for a season and it may have been a long, long, long season or the, or the Lord may <clears throat> release you from doing something and um, require you to use them to change things. And by changing things, I'm not talking about violating the Word of God. I'm talking about knowing the difference between when it's time for you to pick up your cross and follow Jesus, die to yourself, and serve, and when the Lord, and if the Lord, changes your assignment, when He no longer requires you to do that, because He brings about an alternative which is as loving in his eyes for the person or persons you may be ministering to. I, I can't address that subject in depth. I'm just trying to touch on it. Now, and what is required is growth in the Lord because you have to be able to discern between true guilt when you're truly being selfish and being convicted by the Lord which involves true guilt, which requires repentance. And if you're feeling guilty where the Lord is not holding you accountable or you really have nothing to be guilty about, you just feel guilty because you have, um, well, many many of us have uh, an enormous sense of, of over-responsibility and so you have to discern between the Lord convicting you, which produces true guilt, which is designed to get you to repent, and, but you must discern between true guilt and false guilt. When you False guilt is when you assume guilt upon yourself, when in fact you're not guilty. God's trying to lead you to do something else and you're being released. All right, having said that, you cannot run the race you cannot fulfill your destiny. You cannot build the destiny and the calling and the purpose in the lives of your children and grandchildren or the people that you meet. You can't participate with the Lord in the release of your own destiny. You can't grow your own talents and abilities. You will not see the realization of the vision God has put in your life. And when I say all these things, I want to emphasize not everything in the kingdom of God revolves glamour and being on the stage. That's, that's, that's an American perversion. Okay? God is good and he can do anything. And he does raise people up to do all kinds of amazing and glamorous things. But sometimes God raises you up to do the things that nobody else wants, you to, that nobody else wants to do. But you are called to, to utilize your gifts. To, to, you see, let's just ask this basic question. We have who knows how many millions, just countless millions of, quote, born-again evangelical Christians in the United States of America. I forgot the exact number, but it's a lot. It used to be like 50 million. I don't think it's anywhere near 50 now. So let's say it's 25 million. And even that's questionable, that we have that many true born-again Christians. But let's just throw out the number of 25 million. Even if it's just 25 million, the question must be raised, how could there possibly be 25 million born-again Christians in America and the spiritual, moral, condition of America and the direction of America is going in essentially the negative direction it's going in. Now I'm not going in a totally negative direction because it's not. There are unprecedented changes that have happened in the last couple of years that has given us um, the opportunity for our nation to go in new Directions that that is that has never happened before. So we need to acknowledge that, and we need to invest in that, 
and we need to support that. But overall, it is extremely irresponsible for those of us that call ourselves Christians or the body of Christ in the responsibility of the destiny of our lives, our families, our nations, our nation on one individual or a handful of individuals. That's a cop-out. We've got to do our part. We have to do our part. So the question is, if there are indeed 25 million evangelical born-again Christians, then why is America still, at this moment, and let's face reality, but let's put down the, the hookah pipe and, and face reality, why are there still, with 25 million born-again Christians, why are we still in a downward spiral in which the enemy seems to be victorious in so many, many different spiritual battlefields as evidenced by primarily the fact that 8 out of 10 kids who were raised in evangelical homes, by the time they enter college or get midway through college, 8 out of 10 kids from evangelical homes walk away or reject their faith in Jesus Christ. That is a fact, and that is a social indicator that essentially is a report card to Christians in America. And you know what it says? I'm not here to condemn anybody, but it says F. You have failed. If we can't take ownership of that reality, we can't grow. I'm not saying we've all failed, but we've all failed to one degree or another, and collectively we failed. That is a horrible number. Again, I'm not here. I'm, I'm not trying to condemn people here for it, but that's called a reality check. That shouldn't be happening. So the only way it's happening is that all the people that I'm talking about who look, if all these people that God created, destinies, plans, gifts, talents, and purposes from God, if all these people were actually being obedient and doing what God called them to do, taking care of kingdom business, if they were all doing what God created them to, to, to do, we would not have 8 out of 10 kids from evangelical homes walking away from their faith in Jesus Christ. End of story. There's a disconnect somewhere. So if you ask me, Paul, what's the most important thing we can do? What, what should my priority be? I can tell you immediately what I believe the most important thing you can do and the most important priority you should have is. I can tell you immediately. I've been thinking about this 24-7 for 40 years. It's this. We must understand this not sleepy time, tea time, with the cuddly little bear by the fireplace. I'm glad you like chamomile tea or whatever else is in it, valerian or whatever, that's fine. But when it comes to your spiritual life, you do not need to, to take a sedative. You need to be energized. So, at this moment in time, the latter part of the last days, regarding the American church, different assignments, different focus, different... Uh, directives for the church in France and Great Britain and Ireland and Spain, Italy, Africa, Asia, etc. But many times the, the, there's, there's similar assignments, but they're distinctives. So wherever you are on planet Earth, you have to go to the Lord and get His specific direction and guidance. Since the primary evidence of failure... F on the report card, is that 8 out of 10 kids from evangelicals are walking away from their faith in Jesus Christ or rejecting their faith in Jesus Christ. That should be a cosmic, deafening wake-up alarm. In addition to that, the statistical fact that the fastest-growing religion in America right now is Wicca or witchcraft should be a slap in the face and a cold shower to every American Christian. 
that there is something desperately wrong. So if you ask me, what can we do now at this hour, this is what I would tell you, because I've been thinking about it for 40 years. This this didn't happen overnight. We must immediately correct the bad idea and the bad ideas that have produced the reality and the bad um, consequences that we're experiencing. Remember, let's go back to this foundational principle. Good ideas produce good consequences. Bad ideas produce bad consequences. Bad consequences are the fact that 8 out of 10 kids from evangelical homes are walking away from their faith in Jesus Christ. Bad consequences are the fact is the fact that Wicca or witchcraft is the fastest growing religion in America. Those are bad ideas with bad consequences. They happened, the bad consequences happened as a result of the bad ideas that produced the bad consequences. So if you ask me what we need to do, it's obvious. We need to immediately, at this exact second, change, eradicate, modify, transform the bad ideas now which are producing the bad consequences. This is not a time to plant a garden unless the garden solves the problem. The problem is the bad ideas. That's the problem. The the bad results are a consequence of the bad ideas. How do we change the bad ideas? We have to understand that we're in the greatest battle for the hearts and minds of mankind at this very moment. So we're in a warfare in the area of the mind, in the area of ideas, beliefs, ideologies, opinions, but primarily beliefs and ideas. The ideas and beliefs that are in the heads of most Christians and most people did not come from the Word of God. They they either came from a secularist, anti-Christian programming, or they came from a very perverted, distorted, uh, counterfeit type of Christianity. Thus, they become bad ideas. To create the good results that God wants, and let's emphasize, this is not about us. This is not about us. This is about God and His harvest and His time and plan. To, but God can't work through his people if his people insist upon having bad ideas. Case in point, the spies that went into Canaan and gave the Lord an evil report because they perceived falsely that they couldn't conquer the giants. That was a bad idea that produced bad results. The good idea was the good report by Joshua and Caleb who spied out the land came back to the Lord, gave them a good report, and said with their renewed perception, good idea, that we are well able to conquer the giants. That produced good results. So what we must immediately do is create a state of emergency in which we devote all of our energy, all of our focus, all of our attention, all of our resources, all of our time on immediately removing the bad ideas and replace them with good ideas. And those good ideas can only come from places in which good ideas originate, which requires a draw from sources of information or people who provide information and ideas who not only base them on biblical truths, which are a good idea, but accurately interpret and accurately uh, connect the reality of the good ideas based in the Bible to reality, because we have a lot of people who correctly understand the Bible, but they're completely inept when it comes at connecting the Bible to reality. So, how do we change the ideas, the beliefs, 
We have to get inside the heads and minds of as many people as we can, as fast as we can, to replace the bad ideas with good ideas. We, when we do that, we'll see the good results. It's really very simple. That is the goal of Paul McGuire Ministries and Paris Mountain Church. That is our goal. We live, breathe, eat, sleep this concept. Because this concept, which is an idea, and it's a good idea, will revolutionize our nation and revolutionize our world. Now, don't get scared by the word revolution. I'm not talking about armed things. I'm talking about a spiritual revolution in which the, the, the ideas that were provided and sowed by Satan are toppled, are dismantled, and destroyed in the minds of hundreds of millions of people, and the good ideas that are birthed out of the truth of God's Word are properly communicated and put into the minds of hundreds of millions of people. So when we put the good ideas that come from the Word of God into the minds of hundreds of millions of people by properly and effectively using all social media and of communication, we can then produce the good results. Am I saying that the good results is producing heaven and earth? No, I never said that. That's not our job. Our job is to bring in the last day's soul harvest, to win souls for Jesus Christ, to bring in... Uh, to make disciples of all nations, to occupy the land until he comes, and to do business until he comes. That's our job. But it can only be done by recapturing the power and truth of God's word accurately, rightly dividing the word of God, and then to rebrand the minds of people with good ideas based on the, the vibrant truth of the Bible. We do that, we'll see the results. You will no longer see Wicca or witchcraft as the fastest growing religion. That will stop immediately. You'll see revival among the youth. And Christianity will be the fastest growing religion in America. You'll see that change immediately. You won't hear the report that 8 out of 10 kids from evangelical homes are walking away from their faith in Jesus Christ. What you will hear is is that 8 out of 10 kids raised in atheist homes like this have rejected their atheism and have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That's what you'll hear. You understand what I'm saying? Good ideas, good results. If you do not share with me a the holy passion and the fire that I hope and pray that you can sense in my voice. If you do not share the passion and the fire that I hope you really can sense in me, if you don't share that, then I would humbly suggest to you, not because I am in any way even remotely morally superior, but I would humbly suggest to you that there's something wrong with your inner man. Because any man or woman of God who truly has been born again and the Holy Spirit truly lives inside you. The Spirit of Truth, Jesus Christ, lives inside you. If Jesus Christ really lives inside you, and the Holy Spirit is really inside you, then don't you think it would have to be an irrefutable law that if we were committing ourselves to winning souls by taking good ideas based on the Word of God, and uh, fulfilling the Great Commission and putting the good ideas of salvation and winning souls to Christ into people's hearts and minds and reversing these negative trends and bringing in the last day's soul harvest? Don't you think that the Holy Spirit inside us would dance with delight? Don't you think that Jesus Christ inside of you would rejoice with delight? Of course the Holy Spirit is rejoicing in delight at the prospect of hundreds of millions of people coming into the kingdom of God. Of course the Holy Spirit is dancing with delight. Of course Jesus in you, the hope of glory, is rejoicing and dancing with delight. If you can't sense Jesus Christ dancing with delight in your heart, you can't drink of this passion from the Lord, then there's something wrong. And I'll tell you exactly what's wrong. And it's not to pick on you. You are severed. Somehow or another, you have 
become cut off or severed from the vine. Again, I'm not condemning you. You see, because nobody, no true man or woman of God could possibly not rejoice at the prospect of hundreds of millions of people coming into the kingdom of heaven. The only way that could happen is if you were cut off from the vine or severed from the vine. What do I mean by that? As I said, if you abide in me and I abide in you, and he's talking about a vineyard, then nothing will be impossible for you. So if you are connected to the vine, if you're abiding in Jesus and Jesus is abiding in you, you won't have to fake the passion. It will automatically transmit from me to you or from Jesus to me to you. You understand? So the problem, you got a problem. Nothing is going to happen for your life to the level that you really wanted them in the coming year. That isn't a threat. I'm not, I'm not raining on your parade. I'm talking about, I'm not saying nothing will happen. Think, good things will happen to your life whether you're severed from the vine or connected to the vine. The question is, how much of good things, to what degree, to what quality of good things? If you want abundance, you must repair your soul. And that means you need to repent before we go into this year. You need to just say a prayer like this. I'm not going to make a big deal about it. After listening to this program or right now, you simply need to come clean with the Lord, shucking and jiving. And this is what you say to the Lord. And how do I know what to say? Because I've, I've done what you've done. There's been periods in my life where I've, I had never backslid. I never stopped abiding in the vine or him abiding in me. But I'll tell you what. I let that vine get pretty dead and and ready to, 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 for the string to snap. So I'm no better than you are. I had to repent many times, and I imagine before I get to heaven, I'll have to repent some more. So you're, I'm giving you an opportunity to repent now. If they don't repent in your church, we'll go stay. You know, you know what? If they don't repent in your church, your first of repentance should be to repent for going to a church which doesn't repent. Let's just start right there. And then you can follow it up by simply saying, Lord Jesus Christ, I ask you to forgive me. I hear this guy talking. He's filled with passion. Maybe he's nuts. Maybe he's sane. I don't know. But I, I don't share the passion. Okay, fine. That's great. I got it. So this is what you can do about it. Lord, I just feel spiritually dead when I hear this guy talk. So either he's crazy or I have a spiritual problem. And at this point, you have to make the decision. Assuming you make the decision that you have a spiritual problem, and that's not arrogance on my part, because I could be crazy, but I'm not. Just repent. Just say, Lord, forgive me. Somehow or another, I messed up. Somehow or another, I stopped abiding in you the way you wanted me to. Somehow or another, Lord, I, I stopped letting you abide in me. Somehow or another, Lord... The, the, the vine got cut it severed between me and you I, I don't want that to happen Lord so before or even after this year begins I want to go into this year Lord I'm asking you to repair right now at this very second I'm asking you to supernaturally repair the vine, the connection between me and you Lord help me to abide in you and I invite you Lord to once again abide in me with all your fullness Thank you for, give, for forgiving. Thank you for healing me, Lord. Thank you for forgiving me, Lord. And thank you for your miracle, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Just that simple. Now ask the Lord to give you passion. Lord, now that you've repaired the abiding problem, fill me with your holy passion, God. And I dedicate this year to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So now, now that you've begun entrance into the coming year with a purpose and a passion. Now you need to believe God for the impossible. Because he said, if you abide in him and he abides in you, nothing that you ask him, nothing, he won't refuse anything you ask him. He'll do whatever you ask him to do. 
So you can believe God for the impossible. So the quality of your life should be phenomenal, and you sh- should expect, you should literally expect a spiritual battle, but you should literally expect break- breakthrough, the realization of the dreams and the gifts that God has given you, and you should expect God to develop and release you as a real player in this great end times battle between the forces of good and the forces of darkness. God wants to use you and bless you. God put dreams and gifts in your heart not to tease and taunt you, but to you. To, he wants you. You will only be fulfilled to the degree that you live the life that he planned for you to live before the beginning of time. I hope this message helped you. And I know that people you know will be helped by this message. So I ask you to spread it far and wide. God bless you. I'm your brother in Christ, Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. Paul